Now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, a breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police. In his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. On King, on you husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon. A stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker Pup Wheat and Quaker Pup Rice bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. Say, when you watch hard-riding, hard-fighting Hollywood stars in action, remember this. One after another tells you to eat nourishing breakfasts of delicious Quaker Puff wheat or Quaker Puff rice topped with milk or cream and fruit. Wheat or rice shot from guns furnishes extra health values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. And being shot from guns means they're crisp, Tender, loaded with nut-like flavor. So latch on to the breakfast treat that beats them all. Delicious, nourishing Quaker puffed rice or Quaker puffed wheat. Sergeant Preston was returning from patrol with Yukon King in the lead. The team was flying over the frozen surface of the Klondike, every dog anxious to get home. They rounded a bend in the trail. Ahead, there was a man staggering from side to side. He stopped and turned as he heard the dogs. He was wearing a bandage across his eyes. The sergeant stepped on the brake. Hello, King. Hello, your husband. Hello. Help me. In the name of heaven, help me. What's the matter with your eyes? Uh, snow blind. Oh, here, ride my sled. I'll take you into Dawson. You, you won't leave me like the others. What others? Last night, I heard their voices. I stumbled into their camp, told them about wilderness. They fed me and I went to sleep. When I woke up, they were gone. They, they left me. Or did I dream it all? Oh, blankets feel good. Yes, that's a good idea. You can tell me all about it after we get to the hospital. Dawson, I've made it. One king! One The young prospector sank into a deep sleep, and he was so completely exhausted that when the hospital in Dawson was reached, the sergeant had to carry him inside. He was put to bed at once, and his eyes were treated. Then the nurse, Mary Come Forsythe, woke him to feed him Take some broth. Some more. But sleep appealed to him much more. Oh, sleep. Just one more spoonful. Now, oh, here. All right. You can go back to sleep now. What about it, Mary? Well, Sergeant, it'll be several days before he can see. I know, but is it going to be all right? Oh, I think so. He's tough. He must be if he came all the way from Wilderness Creek on foot. In this weather? Oh, he couldn't have. I'm not sure. He was babbling something about wilderness. Well, there was a strike there last fall. Yes, just before the freeze-up. The men used boats to get there. When can I talk with him? Uh, tomorrow morning. Fine. See you then, Mary. The following morning, Nurse Forsyth met the sergeant at the door of the hospital and led the way to the young prospector's room. His name is Jerry Marvin, Sergeant, and it's true. He did come all the way from Wilderness Creek. It took him nearly three weeks. And toward the end, he ran out of food, and then his eyes went bad. Oh, it's a wonder he made it. Yes. Oh, Jerry, here's Sergeant Preston. Oh, good. Did you tell him about the men? Not yet. You tell him. They need food, Sergeant. Food and medicine. An awful lot of them are sick oh. and in a bad way. We've had blizzard after blizzard. The passes are choked with snow. 
We went up there before the freeze-up, you know. No sleds, no dogs. Six of us, the strongest. Drew lots to see you try to make it and bring help. I was the one. You don't have to worry now, Jerry. You'll send help. We'll get a supply train organized right away, and we'll start tomorrow. Oh, good. How many men are there? About a hundred. Six teams, each team pulling two sleds tandem. That way we'll be able to carry enough. What about medical supplies, Mary? Oh, I've already spoken to Dr. Monday. They'll be ready whenever you want to load them. And young Dr. Jones and I are coming along. You, Mary? Well, from what the boy says, I'll be needed. It's a hard trip. We can't hope to make it in less than two weeks. And when we get into the passes... Oh, you don't have to tell me. But I'm a sourdough and I can take it. You know, I... it's funny. What is there's gold up there, lots of it. The whole creek's been staked, and every claim's a good one. But nobody cares about the gold. It, it's bacon and beans that matter now. All that matters, food and medicine. Yes, I can understand that. There's one more thing I want to ask you about. What's that, Sergeant? You told me yesterday that the night before last you stopped at the camp up the Klondike. The men gave you something to eat, and you told them about wilderness. That's right. You went to sleep, and when you woke up, the men were gone. They deserted you. Yes, I, I was all alone. Were you snow blind at the time? Yes. And they left you alone? Why, that's the same as murder, Sergeant. Maybe I, I just imagined the camp and the men, but their food was hot and good, and I was so hungry. Doesn't sound like imagination to me. How many men were there? Six or seven. I realize you couldn't see them. Do you remember any of their names? Let me think. Yeah, there was Lefty. Oh? He seemed to be their leader. He gave all the orders. Lefty Daniel, Sergeant. Probably. Probably the whole gang. The one that held up the express office in 40 Mile and killed those two men. Yes. Oh, Jerry, you're lucky they only left you. It's a wonder they didn't kill you. Probably thought they were killing him by deserting him. You told them all about wilderness, Jerry. Yes, Sergeant. The gold and the sickness? Yes, they kept asking questions and I answered them all. That's bad, Jerry. It's going to be hard enough, the trip to wilderness. After we get there, I'm afraid we'll meet Lefty and his gang. Lots of gold and men too weak to defend themselves. Lefty couldn't ask for anything better than that. There's no telling what we'll find. From the hospital, the sergeant hurried to headquarters and made his report to the inspector. The inspector approved his plans for the relief of the Wilderness Creek miners and then considered the problem of Lefty Daniels' gang. And you think that they may be heading for Wilderness too? It's possible, sir. Except that they must be running short of supplies themselves. They head for a starvation camp. I don't know, Sergeant. They might pick up supplies en route, sir. Well, that's true. Where was it this young prospector stumbled on their camp? On the Klondike. I should judge a little bit beyond Leota. He couldn't have walked more than a couple of miles before I picked him up. Hmm. Well, Webster's assigned to the case. He'd better get up there. It snowed yesterday, sir. Won't be any tracks to follow. But six or seven men traveling together. Someone will have seen them. Webster should be able to pick up that trail. If it leads to wilderness, you and Downey might arrive in time to give him a hand with the arrest. He may need help, sir. If they're heading south, he'll get it at Whitehorse. At any rate, your first job will be to see that the supplies get through. There's you and Constable Downey. You'll need more drivers. Doc Jones can drive. I can get Bill Stewart, Jeff Smith, and Harry Lang. They have their own sleds and teams. That means that we'll have to furnish three teams and six sleds. We have them, sir. You're free to draw on our commissary, of course. And you can charge anything else that you need to the forces account. Thank you, sir. Go to it, Sergeant, and the best of luck. We may need it, sir. Come on, King. <coughs> Stuart, Smith, and Lang were contacted and agreed to make the trip with the sergeant. By late afternoon, the 12 sleds were loaded. And since there was a full moon, it was decided to start at once. Nearly the whole population of Dawson gathered around headquarters to say goodbye and speed them on their way. Goodbye, Sergeant. With the sergeant in the lead, the relief train headed down Front Street, and then turned east on the Klondike. The weather was clear and cold, and the snow hard packed on the trail. The dogs threw their weight into the harness, and the sleds moved easily on their iced runners. But this was the easy part of the trip. And ahead lay mountain passes choked with snow, the threat of avalanches, and of sudden storms roaring down from the icy peaks. They ran into their first blizzard when they were a day's travel beyond the headwaters of the Klondike. Luckily, there was a trading post there to give them shelter for the night. But the owner had bad news. You're sure it was Lefty Daniels? Well, absolutely. 
I didn't have much gold, and he wasn't interested in furs, so it could have been worse. Well, just what did he take besides your gold? Well, there was flour, bacon, beans. Ammunition? All I had. How long ago was this? Uh, four days. And you reported the holdup to Constable Webster? Sure. He came by the next day. I suppose he followed them into the mountains. Hardly stopped to eat. He came by here at noon. How many men with Lefty? Well, there were six. I uh, recognized a couple of them. A breed they call Kasoya and Scar Murdoch. Yes, they were both seen in 40 Mile and the express office was held up. Six of them. And with Lefty, that's seven. I sure hope old Webster doesn't try to take on the whole crew. He knows we'll be along. Only thing I'm afraid of is an ambush. That's dangerous country ahead. I feel like pushing on. We wouldn't gain much. I should say not. You'd only wear out your dogs. We'll wait until the storm's over. Still a long way to wilderness. Even with the storm over, the drifted snow turned travel into a constant battle against cold and weariness. Now, Yukon King was unable to break the trail for the teams, and the sergeant walked ahead of him on snowshoes. The relief sleds covered only ten miles during the first twelve hours after leaving the trading post. The second day of travel netted twenty miles. But then, the first of the mountain passes was reached, and their progress dwindled to less than a mile an hour again. It was during the fourth day that King started to bark as the sergeant was plowing his way around the huge drift. What is it, King? Oh, boy, it's easy to What's underneath there? Now, wait a minute, fellow Alan Harnish. Once freed of the traces, King made the snow fly, and at last he uncovered a pile of stones. That's strange. What is it, sergeant? These stones look like a cache. A couple of shovels on the first sled. Let's give King a hand. Right. A few minutes later, the sergeant, Constable Downey, and King had uncovered three piles of stones. And the other members of the party gathered around as they started to throw the stones aside. What? Oh! Not caches, no. Grave, sergeant. Yes. Constable Webster. The breed Kosaya. Well, that must be another member of the gang. They got Webster coming through here, but he got two of them. It's up to us to get the rest of them. We'll continue our adventure in just a moment. Say, fellas and girls, do you know what's coming this month? Valentine's Day. Gee, aren't Valentine's a wonderful idea? Hmm. I wonder who's at the door. Why, it's our old friend, the postman. Say, am I glad to see you. Howdy, young fella. Don't tell me you're already delivering valentines. I sure am. Got any for me? <laughs> yep. Here's a pretty special one. Oh. Gee, it's real pretty. And it says, to my valentine. That's to you, bub, from my wife. And it says here... Thanks for tipping us off to those wonderful breakfasts of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. My husband has been a different man ever since. <laughs> That's me. You? Yep. Seems like I never used to care much for breakfast. Oh? Son, you should see me now. You mean you eat a big bowl full of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice every morning? Do I? Say, I pour on the old milk or cream, add some fruit, and it sure tastes good. Mighty good for you, too. Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice furnish added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. Well, that's why I eat Quaker puffed wheat one day and Quaker puffed rice the next. That's a swell idea. And say, fellas and girls, don't you miss out a single day either. Buy both delicious kinds, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. These swell-tasting, ready-to-serve cereals are shot from guns. To make them crisp and tender. Yes, these king-size premium grains are exploded up to eight times normal size to make them bigger and better tasting. Ask Mom right now to order big red and blue packages of delicious Quaker popped wheat and Quaker popped rice. Shot from guns. Now to continue. As Sergeant Preston and the relief train struggled through the passes, Lefty Daniels and his gang had descended on Wilderness Creek. In the dead of night, and moving swiftly and silently, they forced their way into cabin after cabin. Hey, what's the idea? Keep them covered, Joe. Right. Light the lamp, Scar. Right. 
If you're looking for gold... You keep your mouth shut or Joe will put a bullet through your brain. Not much of the way supplies, Lefty. Take them all. And any guns and ammunition. Right. Don't take my food. I haven't got much. I told you to shut up. You may as well uh, get this straight. My name is Lefty Daniels, and I'm taking over Wilderness Creek. I've set up my headquarters at the big cabin near the mouth. You can't... You... I can do anything I want to, and this is the way it's going to be. All the food will be stored in my cabin. If we're not going to bother looking for your gold, you've probably got it well hidden. But you're going to use that gold to buy food. A pound of flour for a pound of dust. What? Well, that's the price now. It may go up. You won't get away with this. The Northwest Mart will be coming after you. <laughs> We've already taken care of the Northwest Mounted. Tell them about young Marvin. Yeah, the one you sent to Dawson for help. He paid us a visit one night. He was snow blind. We left him to die by the side of the trail. You won't be getting any food from Dawson. If you want to eat, you'll have to buy from us. Better get up early and start digging. It's going to cost plenty to live on Wilderness Creek from now on. But the men who are sick... You'll have to pay their freight as well as your own. Hey, got everything, Scar? All there is. And let's get on to the next cabin. Come right, on, Joe. Come on. Two days later, Lefty and Scar were weighing out gold dust in the cabin Lefty was using as his headquarters. Lefty, we got enough of this stuff. Think so? Yeah, it's every ounce the miners have. Well, they can thaw out the ground and dig more. But we've got enough. Why not load up all the supplies we have and start out tomorrow? Follow the wilderness to the Yarrow and the Yarrow to the Porcupine. We could be in Alaska in less than a week, and we'd be safe with all the gold we'll ever need. There's more here for the taking. But we'll be paying for it for food. No matter what you charge, the food's worth more than the gold. Lefty. Yeah, what's the matter? I've just been up to the ridge. I had these binoculars with me, and I took a look back to the east. The way we came, across Wolf Valley. Well? Way on the other side of it, 20 miles, I saw some sleds coming through the pass. You couldn't see that far and be sure. From way up there and on a day like today, of course you can. Uh, probably a pack of wolves. Oh, no. Just specks, I grant you, but I studied the way they moved. Single file and in a straight line. Sleds and dogs and men. If you don't believe me, take the glasses. Go there and see for yourself. How many? I couldn't tell that for sure, but a lot of them. Did Marvin have got through to Dawson after all? That's what I'm thinking. Uh, somebody might have found him. That mountain you shot. Marvin could have put him on our trail. No, he picked up our trail at the trading post. If those sleds are loaded with supplies, there'll be other Mounties with them. Yeah, that's right. Well, what of it? What of it? Let's get out of here. They have them breathing down our necks all the way to Alaska? No, thanks. This isn't such a bad break. What's good about it? Sky was just saying that food is worth more than gold up here. We can use some more supplies. Go after them? Why not? The snow's deep in the valley. They won't be able to get more than halfway across it today. And it's the dark of the moon. They'll build their campfires big to keep off the wolves. <laughs> Once we surround the camp, it'll be easy. When darkness fell that night, Sergeant Preston called a halt near a grove of pine trees. So there would be plenty of branches for a windbreak and plenty of wood for the campfire. The dogs were fed. And afterwards, the relief party sat around the fire eating bacon and beans. Hey, it was then that the wolves began to howl from the ridges surrounding the valley. The dogs whimpered and burrowed deeper into the snow. All except King, who stood erect and challenging, a low growl in his throat. <coughs> Sounds like the packs are gathering. Packs, Sergeant? Well, if there's only one, it's certainly a big one. They call this place Wolf Valley, don't they? Yes, Mary. We'll have to take turns staying awake tonight. Make sure the fire's kept up. But Sergeant, there's so many of us. Wolves are afraid of men. Up to a certain point they are, Jim. It's our dogs they'll go after. We're not exactly arguing, Sergeant. With a fire and someone watching, you don't really believe there's any danger, do you? Oh, we'll see. When a wolf gets hungry enough, he isn't even afraid of fire. Oh, I've been around the Yukon longer than you have, Jim. I know what I'm talking about. The evening meal was finished, but no one felt like going to sleep. The howling of the wolves stopped. Still, there was no reassurance in the silence. It was dark, very dark. Nothing could be seen beyond the circle of light cast by the campfire. Until suddenly... There. That's the first one. First what? The first wolf. You see where I'm pointing? Those two points of light, green. Mm -hmm. I'm right, aren't I, Sergeant? Yes, Mary. That's wolf. I'll take him off. <laughs> Got him. That's one now. Good shot, Jim. Hey, what's that? 
More wolves. You've given them a meal. They're starving, all right. We might as well hold our fire until they start coming closer. It was not long after that a great circle seemed to be drawn around the camp. A circle etched in pinpoints of green fire. The men waited with their rifles ready, firing only when a wolf started toward them. Here's one, Chip. Then the horrible snarling would echo through the night, once more to be succeeded by an ominous quiet, a silence charged with suspense. King crouched by his master's side, alert to every move his wild enemies made. And it was he who gave the warning as the wolves made their first charge on the sled. Come on, pour lead into them. <laughs> Keep firing. Drive them back. The charge was driven back. The gaunt, ghostly bodies faded into the darkness. But for some reason, King still was uneasy, sniffing the air and growling. Where are they, Sergeant? We can't even see their eyes now. They haven't gone far. King may have caught the scent of another kind of wolf. Well, we're not far from wilderness. That's what I mean, Jim, and this fire can be seen for a long way across the valley. But we've got to have the fire to keep the wolves back. There are some animals more dangerous than you. Down, everybody! Help me put out the fire. Throw snow on it, and then crawl away. Quickly, the men followed the sergeant's orders. In a matter of seconds, the fire was out. But Bill Stewart had caught a bullet in his leg. Mary crawled to his side and bandaged it as the sergeant gave direction. Don't anyone fire. We'll only give them a target. They can't see us in this light any more than we can see them. You think it's Lefty and his gang? I'm sure of it. Well, the dark may protect us from them, but the wolves can find us. What if they come after us again? We'll have to shoot. Wait for my word. It was agonizing, waiting in the cold and darkness, with every muscle taut, eyes and ears alert for the slightest movement. Lefty and his men were also holding their fire so as not to give their positions away. The sergeant realized it was a stalemate which would be broken in the outlaw's favor whenever the wolves rallied for a second attack. He considered every possibility and then decided to take a long chance. Jim. Yes? I'm going after them. You better come with me. After Lefty and the others? Yes. But we don't know where they are. We have no idea. King will find them for us. Where are the handcuffs? I have a couple of pair. More on the first sled. I'll take some. Leave your rifle. It's too clumsy. You better carry two revolvers. Okay. Golly, Sergeant. There isn't much chance. It's the only one I can think of. We'll start with the woods. Go on, King. The men. Find the men. Then began a desperate game of blind man's buff, with King's keen nose serving his eyes for the sergeant and Constable Downey. It was so dark they could not see the trees until their shoulders scraped the trunk of one. The sergeant laid a restraining hand on King's harness, and they crawled forward inch by inch. When King stopped, the sergeant could still see nothing, but he could hear something. The steady breathing of a man only a few feet away. The sergeant held his own breath and then struck out with the butt of his revolver. The sergeant snapped a pair of handcuffs around the man's wrists and leaving Constable Downey to guard him, crawled on. King led him to a second man and a third, and each of them was taken care of in exactly the same way and dragged back for Downey to guard. The sergeant and King started out again. They had crawled for 50 yards when King jumped to his feet and growled. King, down. But King would not obey his master, for half a dozen wolves were racing toward them. Sorry, King, I didn't understand. King met the lead wolf's attack, and the sergeant picked off those that were following him. But as soon as he started to shoot, the reports of other guns sounded, and bullets kicked up the snow around the sergeant. They helped to finish off the wolves, but the sergeant and King were untouched. Those shots came from that direction, King. We've taken care of three. There can only be two left, Murdoch and Daniels. If only it weren't so dark. I know you can find them, boy, but I hate to send you after them. They've been alerted and they know we're in the woods. But I wait right here and make no sound. I didn't think they flicked us off and I'd hope they'd come to make sure. But King was unable to remain quiet. The dead wolves were attracting others and they were closing in around King and the sergeant. The great dog took his master's park in his mouth and pulled it. So I'm wrong, boy. You think we'd better get out of here? All right, go on. King started toward the edge of the woods. They had almost reached them when they heard a frantic cry. It's wolves all around us. Hey, get out of the open. Come on. The sergeant heard two men crashing through the underbrush, and guided by the sound, he ran to meet them. As Scar and Lefty broke from the cover of the trees, he was facing them, his guns ready. Up with your hands. Lefty, You're under arrest in the name of the queen. Get out of the way. There's wolves after us. Just march straight ahead and you'll be safe. Safe to die on the gallows. Move. All right, don't worry. Move. Move. Doc, Jeff, get that fire started again. All the gang are present and accounted for. A few minutes later, the campfire was roaring once more. 
The sergeant and Jeff returned to Jim and helped him with a man the sergeant had knocked out and handcuffed. In less than 15 minutes, the whole gang were lying on the ground beside the fire. There was no sleep that night, for the wolves still roamed the valley. But they faded away with the dawn, and the relief train headed on to wilderness. Smoking! Oh, you husky! Oh, no. The creek was reached in the late afternoon, and the starving miners cheered the sergeant and his companions. Food was distributed, the doctor and Mary began to care for the sick, and the gold left he had taken was returned to its rightful owner. Sergeant, I, I don't know what to say. You to come and save us after all our hope was gone? It's like waking up from a nightmare. The credit doesn't go to me. You brought the sledge through. But we wouldn't have known you needed help if it hadn't been for Jerry Marvin. As for capturing Lefty and his men, well, there was one member of the force who gave his life to make that possible. We only finished the job for him. And it isn't finished yet. We'll take them back to Dawson. They'll be tried, and they'll pay for their crimes with their lives. It's only then we'll be able to say this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Monday's adventure. Fellas and girls, on your mark... Get set. Hey, stop. Hold everything. What's the matter? I was just going to tell all the fellows and girls to race to the store and get the big red and blue packages of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. Oh, I thought you were going to tell them about the thrilling surprise that's coming next Monday. Oh, no, no, that's a secret. I'm not supposed to say a word about it till next Monday. And then, oh boy, oh boy. Yes, then, fellows and girls, you're going to get in on something terrific. We can give you just this hint. It's something wonderful that you're going to get from Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The swell-tasting, crisp, nourishing breakfast cereal that's shot from guns. And it won't cost you an extra penny. Not an extra red cent. So don't miss out. Be listening. Listen Monday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the jailbreak. Matt Nelson was the most vicious and brutal outlaw in the Yukon. And when I finally captured him, everyone drew a sigh of relief. But it turned out we were congratulating ourselves too soon because Matt broke jail the night after he was captured. That jailbreak put a blot on the record of a fine young recruit to the force. It also led me into one of the deadliest gun battles I've ever fought. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Monday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created by George W. Trendle, produced by Trendle Campbell Enterprises, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns. For a delicious hot breakfast, eat Quaker Oats. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Say, boys and girls, do you want to be a star someday in sports and activities? Then start on good Quaker Oats breakfast tomorrow. Because nourishing oatmeal gives you more growth and endurance than any other whole grain cereal. Remember, Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is J. Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Pop Wheat.